Uh, thanks for joining today's bench to market talk on licensing strategies and how to maximize your technology value. Uh, my name is Dr. Courtney Law. I'm the managing director for Biolocity and um, just want to thank you again for joining today's talk. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few announcements. So our next bench to market talk is on March 12th, or sorry, May 12th. Um, it'll be on go to market strategy. Uh, this session is uh, designed to guide you through the process of setting commercialization milestones and determining your most critical next steps. I think it'll be a great talk. So if you're interested in joining, please look or please register at the link on this slide. Um, office hours are still open. They're now open. Um, so if you're interested in legal office hours, we are offering them in partnership with the Emory School of Law. Um, you can see the topics and area of interest that, um, you, that are available for these discussions, um, but they are by appointment only. Uh, so if you're interested, please register at the link below. Uh, Biolocity is actually a part of the BARDA Drive Accelerator. Um, the BARDA network is interested in simulating investment and innovation in health security product, products and technologies, and release, they release different areas of interest. Um, so the current area of interest are displayed on the screen. Um, they're able to provide technical and financial resources to entrepreneurs. And if you're interested or have technologies in any of these areas of interest, please connect um, with us and the Biolocity team and we can uh, help you through that process. Another new initiative that BARDA is hosting is the Mask Innovation Challenge. Um, this challenge seeks to support the development of innovative mask designs for the general public that are low cost, comfortable, and effectively, and effectively protect against respiratory disease pathogens. Uh, 10 teams will be selected in phase one of the challenge, each winning $10,000 to prototype their designs. Um, their application deadline is actually next Thursday, April 21st, and we'll drop a link in the chat for additional information. Um, I'd also like to share information about the Boston Scientific Connected Patient Challenge. This year's theme is telehealth, and they, are current, and they currently have an open call for innovative solutions to improve patient care and connectivity. Um, this challenge welcomes technologies that will connect patients and clinicians, streamline workflow and cl uh, clinician training, uh, facilitate remote device management, and simplify data-driven shared decision-making. Making. Uh, the submission deadline is May 14th. And you can either connect with us or go to the link below or the link on the slide for additional information. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's panel. I think this will be a great talk. Um, so first up, um, introduce you to Dr. Tariana Stewart, um, who currently works at IBM. Uh, she, or Dr. Stewart is an experienced biomedical scientist and intellectual property professional. Her current efforts are directed towards the marketing and licensing of existing IP from IBM research to established companies and investors. Next up, we have Ms. Jackie Hutter. Uh, Ms. Hutter has been recognized for each of the last 12 years for her innovative insights and creative in creating value from IP strategy with the peer awarded top global IP strategist by Intellectual Asset Magazine. While her technical background encompasses chemicals and pharmaceuticals, Ms. Hutter's IP strategy clients are more varied and have included a, for a Fortune 500 consumer hardware company, a large alternate alternative energy company, medical devices, computer vision, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and consumer products. Uh, next up, I have Dr. Jason Lai. Dr. Lai offers clients a business perspective on their IP strategy, providing a line of sight from intellectual property to sustainable revenue growth. Um, his experience includes over 15 years of IP-based deal-making with Kimberly Clark Corporation, Newell Brands, and, um, is, and as an independent patent license broker. And the moderator of our discussion is Dr. John Nikosha. 
Uh, he is a biomedical engineer by training and received his PhD from the BME program at Georgia Tech and Emory. Um, he worked for two years as a licensing associate with Emory um, before joining the Biolocity team last month. Um, following, this following this discussion, we'll have two representatives from Georgia Tech and Emory, Emory licensing offices, Drs. Terry Bray and Todd Scherer, to answer any um, additional questions that you may have. And now I'll turn it over to John. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, Courtney. And thanks again to our panelists for taking the time to be here today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion about licensing strategy and, and IP. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, I, you know, a lot of our audience may be aware of intellectual property. Maybe they've been added as a co-inventor on a patent. Um, but they're not as familiar with sort of what comes next, what a license is. So I think I'll direct this first question maybe to Tariana uh, with some tech transfer background. Could you just maybe tell us sort of what is a license? Why do we need a license to commercialize IP? So I want to say, should I do it from the perspective of like what people think it is versus what it really is? I feel like people are like, oh, I'm going to be a multimillionaire with the license, right? <laughs> Sure. Um, but just like a very simple definition, it's just a license is granting someone the authority to own something or use something um, to do a particular thing. So in this case, it might be a product that might come, a product or a pharmaceutical compound, something like that that comes from research. Got it. Yeah. And so what would be some, some key terms, like say a university was going to negotiate a license with a company to commercialize this? What do those conversations look like? What are the key terms that typically get discussed? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a Terry Bray and what he always says, well, it depends on the situation. Uh, that's something that I learned over at Georgia Tech. Um, that basically, you want to cover things like um, rights that might be retained by each party, uh, rights granted to each other, um, any use or restrictions around the particular product. Um, are there any type of like sub-licensing rights, uh, term limits, things along those lines? Got it. Um, and of course, there are also some financial terms associated with a license as well, right? So mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So what, what kind of stuff might go into sort of the financial components of a license? Again, that's case specific, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, like it's really, it really is hard to say. So, I mean, it's things like royalties, um, payment, uh, patent expenses. So that really just depends on um, the negotiation between the two parties. Sure, thanks. So uh, Jackie or Jason, I guess from the other side here, looking at more of the kind of the intellectual property strategy, um, how have you seen sort of licenses structured either from early stage technologies, whether that's academic or from another company, um, what are some, some key points that get negotiated in, in these types of agreements? Um, well, go ahead, Jason. Oh, sorry, Jack. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would just uh, add to what Tariana said. And, you know, I think the key to what Tariana said is it's all very case specific. I've never seen two licenses that look identical. There's no such thing as a standard license. Um, perhaps with the exception of some software, uh, but even then, there's always extra terms. The um, uh, go go ahead, Jackie. Yeah. Well, um, speaking as the lawyer who's fixed a lot of problems, who's um, actually litigated these things, the biggest problem that that always happens if you're not watching out on it for, for on the front end is when you start jointly working with somebody else, then that's when the problems happen. And if you haven't probably scoped out what you may want to own in the future that may be jointly owned, what grant backs are going to look like, and grant backs are somebody else improved something, and you may want access to that even though they did the work, those sort of things. But, you know, I, uh, when you start, if you will, crossing the streams, of any type of joint intellectual, that anything becomes joint intellectual property is, is where the problems happen. So the, you know, the definition of strategy, and then we're talking IP strategy here in this context, definition of strategy is defining an endpoint and working backwards to make sure that you get that desired endpoint. And when you're talking about somebody else coming in and either jointly working with you or taking your hard-earned work for years that may be subject to an, an initial uh, patenting effort, 
that then becomes a uh, improvement patent, you really need to consider what the future may be and what the scenarios are that you can retain your optionality. So you don't, you as the, um, as the technologist, as the, as the original inventor, doesn't get frozen out of your ability to actually work in your area, but also that does not, you do not get, if you will, um, too grabby so that somebody else says, oh no, you're too hard to work with. You definitely need to, to work out the future state that you want to live in um, and make sure that that's part of the whatever initial conversations you have. And I would, I would add to that, Jackie is 100% correct. Um, the, in fact, one way to think of this is, it's very easy to rush off to Las Vegas and get married, uh, do a transaction with someone, but you really need to think through what's gonna yeah. happen when you decide to part ways. And so in terms of, in terms of that, it's almost a prenuptial agreement that you're writing, those become the key terms uh, in terms of how does the techno, assuming that the technology is going to be, is going to develop somewhat when it's transferred or after it's transferred, who owns it and what can they do with it so that you're able to part ways with that, with that, uh, with that collaborator in the future without litigation. Thanks. Yeah, I, I love the analogy of, of a license being something like a marriage. I think that that's pretty apt in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that it brings up a lot of issues for academic innovators as well. You know, in a lot of cases, we have um, scientists that retain their faculty position and they're working on their research and, and maybe they have some widget that they've developed, companies interested in it, approaches the school for a license. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, that innovator is probably going to continue working in this space, continue developing things. So how, what should those types of people be aware of um, when it comes to these, these issues that you're bringing up about, you know, improvements to their technology that maybe haven't been included in that original license, and then making sure that they have the freedom to continue, you know, their research and developing in this space? Sure. This so I, 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 oh, I, we're friend by, friends, by the way, so we're going to probably do this. So that <laughs> um, blessing and a curse. But uh, if I if I could, Jason, um, the you, know, you you as the university researcher by definition need somebody to help you. You need somebody else's capabilities to come in and bring this thing to market. If you did not need that, you wouldn't need to license that. You would go out and develop that company yourself. And that's that's definitely I, I expect we're going to be talking about that. Did, uh, are you going to build the company yourself? Are you going to are you going to bring somebody else to to in to build it? Realistically, and again, I have I have litigated this stuff. I've been involved in this in this business at all levels, um, you know, for for you know, gosh, twenty five years now, and I can tell you from from you know uh, lived experience, it is uh, it is fairly unlikely, if not if not impossible, it's fairly unlikely that somebody who's commercializing a technology for the purposes of solving a problem and getting paid for it is going to be de developing technology that is going to block you from continuing on your research path. Yes, it seems like, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to be doing stuff and it's gonna block me. But in the real world, people's paths diverge. And so I have, you know, there are, and by the way, there is case law on this, okay, about people being blocked from doing their stuff. And that's why it seems to be a big deal because the lawyers litigate it and the lawyers think a lot about this stuff. And because there's, there, there's, there's horror stories on this, lawyers focus on horror stories, they don't vote, focus on reality. So what I can, what I can give uh, as, as a cautionary tale is that yes, there's a horror story, but in all likelihood that horror story is not gonna happen to you. Think about realities. And, and because if you, if you get, again, use grabby, you know, people get grabby. If you, you wanna be all grabby because of, of hypotheticals upon hypotheticals upon hypotheticals that are probably, Rarely remote, you know, never going to happen. You're going to be, in, in all likelihood, perceived as being uh, difficult to work with, and you're never going to get a license done. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess Tariana, coming back to you, I think you have an interesting perspective as someone who's worked in out licensing from uh, academia as well as now out licensing from a company. Um, how have you sort of handled these issues in in your role as a as a licensing manager? 
um, to you know both shield your your own institution from the risk of you know losing rights to these things or yeah how, how do you kind of um, handle that issue in, in the licenses that you negotiate? I'm sorry, Don, can you say that one more time? The Zoom kind of uh, did this funky thing again. Sorry, say that oh, one more time. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, we're, we're talking about, you know, potential risks uh, with, with early licensing strategy and how to make sure your bases are covered, both as an innovator to make sure that you still have the, the you know, freedom to operate in your space um, and how to handle, you know, if technology that might still be evolving and, and may change over time and may not be, you know, initially captured in the license. Um, how have you addressed those issues in, in your licensing roles? Um. I think we may have lost Tariana for a minute there. Um, I will say that from a, from my experience in technology transfer, I know that you know it's it's very clear that universities still have to have a, a right to to their own research uh, for research and educational purposes. So that's something that I know is very common in um, in academic licensing. And I, I'm curious if Tariana can come back on at some point about about how that issue is is handled in in, uh, in the corporate world as well. But uh, but Jason, I yeah you uh, <laughs> you you know something to say here. So, so if we're licensing from an academia situation, typically those types of technologies are fairly low in their stage of development. Mm -hmm. So they may be at, say, a pilot plant level would probably be the most advanced that you'd find in, mo in many cases. That's not always true, but, but in many cases. And there is an amount of risk with taking an early stage technology to commercial. And so, so really part of the, so, so one way to help get that license agreement in place is to find ways to ameliorate that risk. So for instance, <laughs> unfortunately, Tariana just sent a message saying that her Wi-Fi is just kicked off, but <laughs> um, I'm sure she'll try and uh, contact once she resolves that. Okay. Um, so for instance, those, those mitigations might be milestone payments instead of one big large ups, upfront fee. Um, and it's very difficult actually to find funding and interest outside when your stage of development is at that point where it's kind of in, in fact, it's in my book, I've, I've called it Death Valley because very early on in the project, you can put a little bit of money in and get a large impact because you can you can advance it quite a long way in the lab for relatively low cost. Once you get your patent issued again, it's thousands of dollars, but it's still nothing like the, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars you're gonna go through as you scale up. And so it's that place from between like the early stage development onto uh, where you start to see you're very close to production, you've cleared regulatory and all of those risks, that's when people become interested again in these technologies. It's tough to fund things in that death valley. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a very, very common problem that our innovators run into. And I'm wondering, you know, digging into that a little bit further, uh, I think the issue of fundraising is something that's on a lot of our, our audience's mind here. Um, what types of, how, how does licensing or IP strategy affect fundraising, especially at this early stage? You know, we're, we're stuck in the valley of death. Are there things that innovators can do to improve their chances of funding that are related to, you know, licensing or IP strategy? Who, who do you want to answer that? I'm wondering if you should. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, how about, uh, we'll come back to Jackie, maybe. Okay, well, I work a lot with startups that are that are uh, seeking funding and are funded and also up to early stage. Uh, mm -hmm. These are all technologists. These are technologists who are solving real consumer problems and you know working really hard to do so, validating customers and building business models. Um, and that I, I tell folks that uh, who come to me for help so with their IP strategy, companies do not buy or license patents. They buy or license business models. That's right. They, uh, so you know, the, 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 
the times in my career that I have seen somebody license what we call a bear patent, a bear patent license, a license that's not associated with any type of demonstrable monetary value, either now or in the future, if somebody does a lot of work, um, you just have to, you just have to recognize your patent, no matter how great your, your, uh, your uh, innovation appears to be, um, it's probably worth nothing unless you can demonstrate value. Um, so early on with my folks, I work with PhD technologists in all kinds of areas, not so much bio and, and, and um, these days, I used to do that. I work with medical devices and computer vision and uh, machine learning and that, all that, the kind of more techie stuff. Uh, but what I see is that very early on, you have to get institutional funding, such as at a university, uh, state funding. I work a lot of the, with the folks out of ACDC, out of the, the Georgia Tech, uh, the Georgia University of uh, Georgia funded areas. Um, and there is seed money available there. Of course, friends and family. If you, you know, and typically folks will go around to their own networks and you know, to re usually about the hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar range. And hopefully, their friend, their friends and family will still like them after after everything happens. Uh, but you know, the best, the, the best and most uh, available funding for folks at the very early stages that I work with is government funding, um, you know, uh, NSF funding, um, all, all those, the, the uh, military organizations, BARDA funding, that sort of thing. Um, you really cannot expect professional investor funding until you are showing that you have a validated customer. That's a great point, yeah. And to add to that, a licensee can indeed show that you've got some revenue coming in and a validated customer. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, uh, that's, that's a good point as well. And you remind me, I really like this distinction of, you know, investors will fund business plans, not individual IP. Wait, wait, um, I want to be clear. I want to be clear. Not business plans, business models. Models. Okay? Business models means that you have, you have, you have a product that people will pay more money than it costs you to, to, to make it, and it's scalable. That's a business model. John, may I chime in? Jackie yeah, and yeah. Uh, Jason, what are your opinions? I've noticed with the VC firms, like, do you think maybe they might tend to invest more in uh, people versus business model? That's something that I've seen uh, a lot, too, in the VC space. I, I, I can speak from that to the standpoint. I work with modern startups. Yeah. I guess I used to call, I call them modern stuff, lean startups. Folks that have, I can show that they, if they have never started a company before, that they are not flying by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. You know, they are using, they are using established uh, uh, infrastructures and models to, to, to not make the same mistakes that everybody else has made in the past. Um, and, and when I put a shout out, I don't know how this in, is involved with your organization. I probably should have found out first, but I am a huge fan of the I-Corps model for, for university funding. So if, uh, if just, uh, I'll put that, I can have somebody put that in the, in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the chat, but you know, not even, if it's not i core per se, it's the model that i core follows, which is an adoption of the modern startup, lean startup model. Yeah, absolutely. The i is a tremendous program for, especially for things like customer discovery and really identifying your, your unmet need there. Um, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this um, idea of kind of intellectual property and how it relates to, um, to licensing strategy, because you, you brought up that nobody will license kind of a bare patent. And it reminded me that for a lot of our technologies, the IP itself may be at a very early stage. Maybe we only have a provisional patent filed, something that's kind of thrown together before public disclosure. Um, so I wanted to get your opinion. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Jackie, again. You know, can you license a patent that's not issued, that's still undergoing prosecution? And what issues does that bring up? You can. Um, you know, if, if somebody wants it enough, right, if, you, if you're pitching what somebody else is catching, of course, of course you can do that. Um, you know, my, my experience recently is, is rather unique in that I'm working with companies that are out there validating customers. And what we typically do in that case is when they have, we wait to file something until they have, you know, they have a validated customer. Um, and what we do at that point is we file for accelerated examination. And I have a, a young company, um, and it's, they're young because they're they are young. It's not because they haven't been doing this for a few years. They come out of the Tiger program at Georgia Tech, MBA and uh, PhD uh, computer vision guy got together very early on. 
Um, and um, they they validated they validated a, a, a medical imaging technique, and we filed a patent application, and they found a licensee before it issued. Uh, but it issued it in a little over a year, so we were very close to issuance by the time the the incumbent uh, company that needed this technology uh, you know, was ready to license. But importantly, because they they followed this strategy, which was very in intentional, and they were very smart folks and, and, and knew that this is what they wanted to do, and I took their direction, uh, they have now been able to uh, fund their other efforts by not taking dilutive capital because their licensing revenue is paying for the development in, in other domains. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, that, that that's really helpful. Tariana, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on that too, because I, I remember from my days in technology transfer, you know, we didn't always have the luxury of, of waiting. Time. For the right <laughs> time to file, exactly. So how have you kind of addressed that um, either in your role at Georgia Tech or now at IBM as well? Um, the one thing when I was at Georgia Tech is I was trying to educate researchers on having a strategy before they even submit an invention disclosure. Um, I like to use the analogy of you know, you might have a 13 or 14 year old that you spent 13 years training to be the best of the best. They could speak 10 languages, can code, do whatever you need to do. Um, but that doesn't mean that Apple or IBM or Google is going to hire your 14 year old. So it, it's going to take time because why the, the 14 year old is not developed, right? And it doesn't fit into the business plan of like major corporations to hire a 14 year old, even though it might be, you might think it's the best, he's like the best or she's the best of the best, doesn't mean that the company will. So, but however, uh, pick an environment to where your little genius can thrive, like a university, right? So it's a matter of understanding where your technology is and where it needs to be for a certain licensee to pick it up. So you may not have to shoot for the stars with like a major top four, you know, Fortune 500 company, but maybe you want to go for the company that wants to be the next Fortune 500 company that can then develop and grow and, you know, and help your product or your widget or whatever it is. Um, you know, I mean, the classic example is might be like pharmaceutical compounds, right? Like most universities aren't going to have access to clinical trials or not going to go to FDA approval. And so you might need to go with like a smaller company that can help you do that. Great. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really helpful point. Um, I certainly remember, you know, trying to sketch out the business uh, model for early stage technologies can, mm -hmm. can definitely be challenging, but I, I agree that you know the earlier you can start having these conversations with your tech transfer office or other advisors, yeah. I think really helps build that out. Well, well, well John, I also to, to carry on at the point, it's like we really have to decide what you want to be. Do you want to do you do you want to build a business and be part of the business growth and development, or do you want to be a university re researcher? Do you want to you know it's it, you, you really, I know there's buildings on Emory's campus that, that, sh that, that, that ostensibly prove otherwise, but you really, most people can't be both, right? Perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And it reminds me of another uh, point that I, that I wanted to bring up here is, uh, you know, a lot of our innovators are considering, okay, do I want to go this alone? Do I want to start my own company, try to collect fundraising, or do I want to partner with a larger existing firm? Um, so I'd be interested to get each of your takes on sort of what are some considerations from that? And I know it's a pretty big question because there's, you know, lifestyle, personality kind of considerations, and then also just maybe the technology itself. Are some technologies more at home in an existing kind of business or, or do some really have the potential to support an entire new company? So maybe partner, <laughs> partner, and particularly it takes a certain personality type to be an entrepreneur. And that's because you're incredibly smart in your lab does not mean that you are CEO material of a major company. Mm -hmm. I've always encouraged um, some type of like industry collaboration, right? To mm -hmm. work with another company that can take your technology to the next level. What if you've got um, a, you know, maybe not in a, an existing like large company, but say you don't want to be the CEO, you know, you want to keep your lab, you want to stay mm -hmm. an academic researcher but you've got some connections with like a, a CEO team and, and maybe they could sort of form this new company. Um, what are some considerations for, you know, maybe going one of those two routes, assuming that we're, that our innovator in this situation is going to keep their primary academic appointments? That, that's going to be hard in my experience because you're going to be torn and taken to directions that you, you really can't go you know, in your academic research. It's one thing to be a consultant who gets paid for hourly assistant to do technical, technical uh, provide technical insights and guidance. But realistically, the business has to go, if the business is being correctly led, the business is gonna go where the customer takes them. 
um, not where your technology, you know, the technology enables the customer value to be provided. And so it, 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 unless you're running or running alongside of the business, um, as part of the business, it, it's doubtful that it, you're going to be able to continue over the long term with them. You know, of course, there are exceptions, but but in, in, um, most of the time, that's the case in my experience. Makes sense. Jason, how do you feel about this? Do you do you think there are some instances in which it might make sense for uh, for our in, inventors here to pursue kind of a, a startup company? I, I know, I think these are all great points, but in the back of people's mind, maybe they're thinking, oh, well, I knew this guy who had this really, you know, it's successful startup, so-and-so made millions, you know, how does that happen? <laughs> so, and that's a very good question. And, 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 and I think you've heard now from uh, Jackie and Tariana that it takes a certain skill set. Um, you also heard um, people say that that in fact, when people invest in you, they really invest in you as well as the technology, as well as the business, it's a package. Mm -hmm. But definitely that entrepreneur is, is what you're investing in. And those investors are gonna look at their track record. So if you've never done it before, you need to build a team with people that include those that have done it before. Um, one of the other panelists also pointed out that entrepreneurs tend to have a specific personality. And there's a reason for that. Um, the, they, have to, they have to be able to be incredibly resilient. They have to be able to hear no hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and still keep on chugging to the next door to knock on. Um, and that takes, that takes a special kind of person. So it, it all depends in terms of whether or not they should be an entrepreneur. It all depends on what they've done in the past, what their personality is like, and whether or not they can build a team to, to help offset any deficiencies that they may have as that CEO. And what I what I can say as advice is as having somebody been somebody who's been involved in this the, the growth of the establishment of startup companies that are now very successful as their as their long term advisor is if you you are a first time if you want to be an entrepreneur if you if you've talked to your family and and they know what's involved and you still want to do that uh, then the best thing you can do is find a CEO experienced CEO who wants to do this. Um, and that you can show that you have, you have the desire, you have the skill, and that you are coachable. You know you are missing, the, the, you are missing what you need to do this on your own, and you're willing to, to do whatever possible and whatever is needed to, to move alongside with the CEO and continue to develop the technology so that you can build a, build a sustainable business that, and exit from it, presuming you want to exit. Yeah, I think that's a great point. There's certainly an element of humility needed <laughs> to be an entrepreneur um, and to recognize what you don't know. Uh, we did get a question from the audience that I think is related to this conversation, um, and it's, it's directed to Jackie. Um, you'd mentioned government sort of funding mechanisms like SBIR and STTR as, as good for sort of this early stage technology. And, and our uh, audience member asks, doesn't that sort of funding kind of force investigators to be a jack of all trades and to kind of divide their attention between some of these sort of uh, entrepreneurial or business development activities and their and their research? Well, you've got to make a decision, right? So do you want to be a researcher or do you want to push your research to to the public in a different way than, you know, and I'm married to an academic, by the way, I'm not being Pollyannish about this. Um, you 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 have to, you, there, you cannot be all things, right? So, um, you know, I'm one who you know, personally, uh, as a former researcher and been working with, with folks for, for uh, uh, most of my career, uh, like, like the folks that are on this call, um, I, I strongly believe that most of the problems we have in the world have been solved. The problem is that the people who are solving the problems don't really know what the problems are. And by going the STTI, uh, you know, the going the funding route, going the entrepreneurship route, then we have the opportunity to marry, marry the problems with the solutions. Otherwise, the solutions and the problems are going to stay siloed. So we're, we're never going to get, we're, we're never going to be able to move, to move things forward unless we actually realize that we have to cross the streams between uh, filthy lucre and, and pure research. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, and so returning to your earlier point about finding an experienced CEO, finding a management team that can help you move this forward. Um, one question that's probably burning in people's minds is, how do I do that? You know, how do I meet these people that have had this track record of success and, and convince them that I'm the person they should, they should put their uh, faith in? So, so first of all, you got to get out of the lab, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's, the, that's the first step. But I can tell you what I know. I have actually a CEO that I've been working with for years. who's um, become a very good friend, actually. And he was a mentor at ATDC. And the mentors at ATDC, the reason that they, oh, that's the Georgia Tech Incubator Accelerator. I hope everybody knows that. And the reason the mentors actually don't get paid very much and sit and talk to, talk to people all day long is they're literally shopping for their next company, right? They, are, they, are, they have successfully exited. Uh, they have done something before, and now they're work, wait, looking for their next gig. Or they know people who are looking for their next gig, right? So it, there are places you can go that you can have the conversations, and people are very open and receptive. And this one CEO that, again, I've been working with for years, become a good friend, he actually had me come in and, uh, and actually vet potential CEOs, potential partners for him, technologists. He had me look at their patents. This is the university patents, by the way, to tell you know, uh, whether I thought the patents had, had legs, if you will, and also whether, I, you know, whether in conversations that I thought the, the person who was bringing the technology to the table was actually coachable, was actually you know, with somebody. And so you know, it, it, to Jason's point earlier, it is a long-term relationship. You're going to be with these people for, for, for years or it's going to end really badly. And for each of my clients that I've been there since day one, literally since day one, and I have other clients that, that, are, that are not as, as far advanced, but you know, these are six and seven year relationships that are still ongoing. Okay, it's a long time. You know, a lot of, it's a lot of longer than most mar a lot of marriages, right? <laughs> I do want to um, add to that. There's actually a new resource. Um, Russell Allen, he used to be in charge of Georgia Bio and then GRA. He actually started a company called Biotech Executive. Um, is actually helping to find CEOs or is matching CEOs with startup companies. So that's actually here in Atlanta. You can reach out. I mean, probably find Russell on LinkedIn or something like that, or maybe I can find the website. But there's actually a new resource that people can go to to help you find your C-suite. That's great. Yeah. Um, and we got a couple other questions uh, along this point, and maybe I'll, I'll direct this to, uh, to Jason here. Um, from your experiences, what are some of the specific characteristics that make someone a solid CEO, a good candidate for an early stage process like a technology like this? That is a great question. So first of all, the CEO won't, be, won't necessarily be the same person throughout the evolution of the startup. The CEO has to make an assessment in terms of what is needed um, at that time. So for instance, um, you need someone that's a good team builder, that's very trustworthy and has the ability to speak cogently with other C-level peers, as well as project a, an image of uh, calm and control uh, towards venture capitalists because they are indeed going to be investing in that CEO. The One of the things that I find is interesting about CEOs as well as uh, venture capitalists, and it's a huge disconnect actually with academia, is that those types of people tend to think about things and express themselves inductively. So for instance, they will start with the bottom line and they'll give you the bottom line up front. They'll tell you their conclusion rather, and then they will justify you know, why this is the conclusion. However, a lot of researchers in academia tend to want to lead you along and build a story from the ground up before getting to the conclusion. So one thing that I'm always looking for is, are they able to deliver the bottom line up front? And then if whoever it is that's asking needs to, needs the justification for it, then defend what they've, what they've proposed. So that's, that's a fairly subtle personality trait, but uh, inductive versus deductive reasoning preferences is, is something that's uh, a very, um, that's something I look for anyway. 
Yeah, I, I love that distinction. And it reminds me of a lot of the academic innovators and entrepreneurs that we see at Biolocity. You know, a, a lot of times I think the early stages of that we'll have um, these, you know, brilliant scientists giving these academic talks and going into, you know, yeah. starting from the very basics of this mechanistic biology and building up to what is a pretty stunning conclusion. And then our thing is always, why don't you flip that around and tell us why we should be excited about something first. And then, you know, if, if we want to claw into the, you know, uh, all the nitty gritty of it, you know, we, we, we'll get there. <laughs> the other thing that I think is always a giveaway as well as the pitch deck. If it's like 50 slides long and the font is, you know, 10 point tiny weeny, then, then you're going you, th to lose people. <laughs> you know no one I cares mean. about the science. Honestly, no one cares about the science. That's what I say all the time. They really, <laughs> in fact, it's, it's interesting. They, in a way they don't, they just really want to know about the value yep. proposition. Yep. And you're absolutely right, Tariana. Yeah. No. I know you've seen this. I've things. seen it. <laughs> like, no times. I hate to burst your bubble, but like no one cares about the science. Guy Kawasaki has a wonderful, um, uh, has a wonderful, I wouldn't say it's a website, probably it's a training program too, and who knows what, but it's basically your pitch deck in 10 slides or less. And um, I want to say, what's his, oh, I can't remember how it goes now. I think it's 10 slides, anyway. I'm, I'll let you guys yeah, look they, up Guy yeah, Kawasaki yeah. and his uh, 10 slide pitch. These are all solve problems, right? You don't have to learn this, learn this, this stuff on your own. One of the things I might, one of my mottos is that no problem is ever new. It's just new to you. And if you show up talking, trying to talk to somebody and, and indicate that you haven't even tried to figure out how to talk to somebody else, because you're asking them for something, right? You are, you are, you know, you were talking to them because you need what they have, and if you haven't made the made the um, the effort to to present to, to present what you need in a way that's accessible to them, the door is closed. You don't get, and you don't get a second chance from a business perspective. Thanks. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and it comes back to our point about some humility required. You know, knowing what you don't know and finding the people that do know that um, is, is definitely critical. Um, another question that, that just came in that I think is is a pretty good one, um, more on kind of the licensing side of things. Um, someone asked for startups looking for validation of their business model. Does it make sense to offer an early business partner a good deal on a license? Um, how do you make licenses attractive to customers without sacrificing long-term revenue? Well, from my perspective, it depends on what the technology is, right? So, you know, if I'm working with somebody who's bringing an early stage um, uh, technology that's deliverable in a, in, a, um, in a cloud services platform or something like that, of course, it's, you know, technology is patentable, but you can, uh, you can, you can, it's easier to give a, 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 uh, a, um, uh, a sweetheart deal to the first adopter because they're actually taking a risk on you too. Um, and so to, to build that credibility in the marketplace to be able to continue to validation um, and also get, um, get your technology embedded in their technology, which makes, you know, that's very often how my folks uh, get their exit because they're, they're in, in somebody else's, they're so embedded in somebody else's business model that there's, there's nothing, you can't sever it and they end up getting bought. In the content, you have to be very careful in technologies that actually the, um, uh, the, there's not much else to be developed other than the core technology that's patented. For example, um, a, uh, a mechanism, you know, a, 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 bio, a, a bio mechanism or something like that. It would be pretty hard to give somebody a quote unquote sweetheart deal on, on something like that and not, you know, not lose a lot of upside to that. So it's, 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 it, I'm a lawyer. It depends, right? I hate to say that, but just you have to be very careful. But, but for my folks, generally speaking, uh, that are professionally run companies, it's a sweetheart deal out the door as long as that's going to get you get you what you need to get traction in the marketplace. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, we also, so I, I wanted to invite our, our, uh, our Q&A panelists here, uh, Dr. Todd Shear and Dr. Uh, Terry Bray from uh, Emory and Georgia Tech's um, at Tech Transfer uh, groups as well. Um, I think we have a question that came in um, from one of our panelists that that I think will be actually interesting to hear from or from the audience. That'll be interesting to hear from all of our panelists here. Um, 
This one says, uh, in a lot of cases, the interest of the licensee is not the same as that of the licensor. The licensor, in our case, maybe being the university. Um, sometimes the licensee wants to deviate the technology away from what's covered in the original license agreement so that they can avoid paying royalties to the licensor. Um, what is your advice to universities? And, and maybe when we get some perspective from Todd and Terry, how do, how do universities deal with this? So, so maybe I'll start with you, Jason. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. The answer to this is quite short. You need to have a design around brainstorm of your patent. That's a service that um, Slingshot Product Development Group, where I work, offers. Um, and it's very important to do that. Uh, I even have a story about it. Um, <laughs> and that is, there's, there was a uh, license agreement that was generating several million dollars going to a business unit that wasn't doing so well financially. And this, the patents that were being licensed, um, you know, at some point or another, they realized, you know, we're paying all this money. Let's see if we can design around. And that's exactly what um, uh, Jianfeng Zheng is asking in, in the question that they posed. And so eventually they changed their design. They designed around our patent and that money dried up. And, uh, you know, and sure enough, that particular licensee, I did some patent searching and they had filed 28 utility patents around ours before they did the design around. So, the design around brainstorm is what you need to do and you need to file a bunch of patents around it. And, and I have a totally different take than Jason oh. does, as he knows. Yeah, um, I, I don't believe in design around brainstorms um, because uh, uh, you, if you're truly solving a problem in the marketplace, the customer is buying your solution, not your technology. And if you properly characterize your patent rights, then you're not, going to be able, your, your competitors are not going to be able to provide the same solution. Now, that importantly, that requires you to understand what the, what the business model is going to be, what the product's going to be in the marketplace. So it takes a lot more work up front to, to be able to do that. And you have to, so you have to have some customer validation and my folks do. So I live in a different world than everybody does, just to be clear. I'm working with entrepreneurs who are bringing stuff to market. Um, but my, the, the patents that my folks are getting are market-making patents. They, they affect, the, they, they actually affect the competitive, the behavior of the competitors in the marketplace. And so their, their competitors can't design around because there's, there's nothing to, there's, there's no, no, no place to design around. And Jason and I need to have an offline conversation about this, but I talk about this in my podcast, Winning with Patents and IP. Um, just a plug right there. My next, my next uh, season will be all about startups and all about startups specifically. But I talked about this, uh, this whole concept mm -hmm. in that podcast. And what Pat, what what um, uh, uh, what what Jackie is talking about is patent protecting the impact of your product, if I'm not mistaken, Jackie, versus the configuration of your product or your technology. The and your that, customer doesn't care about the product. They care about right. the problem that your pro the product's solving. Yeah. And, that's, and that is, that is a, another way of, of uh, doing, of, of basically achieving a very, like another higher level of claim scope, I think. But not, it, but ev not every patent, not, not every product, not every innovation is worth that, worth that right, kind of effort. Right. Yeah. True. Yeah. I think that's a great distinction. And then I'd love to hear some perspective from Todd and Terry. Um, what do you guys think about this issue of, you know, designing around university yeah. patents and how you, how you okay. deal with that in a, in a, in a, in a license? Well, um, there are a lot of things to say about that, but I will try to limit it to, to one. Um, I think it's well understood that the company uh, is, uh, is going to be focused on maximizing the value of the company. Um, but we, as a licensor of an asset, are, uh, are interested in maximizing the value of our licensed asset. So one of the many reasons that we um, uh, insist on retaining oversight of patent prosecution is so that we have the ability to make sure that our patent prosecution decisions get made um, in a way that's gonna be favorable to our ability to um, stay in the money, so to speak. Um, but there's only so much we can do with that. 
Um, and beyond that, uh, companies can create products and they do all the time uh, that compete and replace our product, in which case then we want uh, a good ability to get the, uh, the license site feedback. Yeah, I agree with what Todd said and, and just to sort of piggyback on what he said, you know, we have very strict diligence terms in our exclusive licenses that our performance milestones, various other milestones the company has to meet and maintain. And if they don't, then we're allowed to pull those patent rights back and hopefully uh, find another uh, licensee. Got it. Yeah. So, that, so some ways of kind of holding the licensee's feet to the fire and making sure they're developing a, a product that, um, you know, that hopefully still matches uh, the, the IP from the university. Um, Todd or, or Terry, I guess, do you have any any war stories in that in that area? At least ones that you could share. <laughs> Uh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> Maybe a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just happens. I mean, to Todd's comment, I mean, companies are going to try to maximize their value and their, and their profits. And if they uh, get a notion that they can come up with an alternative, what they license from you, they're going to try to do it. Um, and, and he also made a good point on making sure that we have control of the patent prosecution. Um, I had an instance where we had that happen at a, another institution I was at, not not here. It wasn't a case I managed, thankfully, but where we had a company directly managing the patent prosecution and they narrowed the scope of the claims uh, to sort of fit their business model and the, the patent issue, there was no continuation or division or anything. And then sometime after that, they terminated the license and we were sort of stuck with a patent that didn't have claims as broad as we should have had. So it made it really hard to try to relicense it. Um, so it's really important to make sure that the licensor is in the loop and has control um, of, of that process. Yeah, I, I mean, my comments and my experience, uh, at least over the last 20 years, um, has really been in the life sciences space. Um, and it's, it's, uh, in my experience, it's a little harder to um, invent around those technologies. I mean, if you've got the peptide sequence for, or a small molecule uh, that works, um, you know, it, it's a little harder to invent around than probably uh, if you've got technology uh, in the technology space um, where uh, people can set out to invent new things every day. Um, that's changing a little bit in the life sciences space. I mean, the, the industry's gotten much trickier about creating prodrugs um, and, uh, and combining um, products into combination products. Um, and so it's gotten a little bit easier, um, but it's still just much more difficult. And, and I haven't found it to be a big problem over the years. I haven't I haven't that often seen examples of where companies were really truly just trying to find a way to write this out of the, the, the picture. Um, not that uh, they've been more directed by, uh, again, to the point, I think it was Jackie that made, they've, they've got a solution, they know their a problem that they know their customers care about and they need to provide a solution. Um, so they're really focused on providing a great solution. But again, I think my comments are probably more of a reflection with the, the fact that the life sciences area, which is so capital intensive, um, and invention is, um, is, a, is a little bit harder to, to, to do um, as opposed to other sectors. That makes sense. Thanks, well, this has been a really interesting discussion. I, I also wanted to have a couple more kind of general comments uh, or general questions, I guess, with Todd and Terry. Um, so say I'm, I'm an academic innovator, I'm working on an early stage project and I think it's got a lot of promise. What's the best way to work with my tech transfer office? When should I engage? How does that, what does that engagement look like? Um, what are just kind of the, the steps of, of going through this and, and starting to work toward a license? Um, we certainly encourage folks to reach out to us, you know, earlier than, than later. If they think they have a, an invention, we're happy to talk through it with them and see if it's far enough along to actually submit the disclosure. And then assuming that it is, submitting the disclosure really is the first step. And uh, then it gets assigned to someone who manages it, does an evaluation and you know, discusses with the inventor sort of the possibilities for next steps and how we might proceed. They may have already identified a company that should have an interest in it. Maybe they have a scientific counterpart that they've been collaborating with a long time or a former grad student who's there, or they may have a notion to do a startup. So it really just depends um, sort of what their ambitions are and perspectives are um, that at least flavors uh, how we might manage a particular case. Yeah, um, uh, obviously earlier is better. Um, at Emory, we have a proactive technology scout that goes out and meets with about 300 faculty a year 
Um, and as John knows, um, we have a commitment to providing a written commercial evaluation report back to everyone who submits an invention, um, even though there's a very early stage inventions, um, because that's a grassroots level focus on trying to provide faculty insight into the tech transfer process and also what's in the prior art. Um, they're very accustomed to reading the prior art in the scientific space, but not necessarily in the patent literature. And so what we want to do early in your experimental protocol experimentation is to give you feedback on what the prior art might look like um, so that should you choose, you have the ability to modify your experimental protocol and maybe head down a different direction that might put us more uh, in a patentable position um, than, than what it is um, currently. Um, but you should definitely um, try to get to your tech transfer office as quickly as possible because the first gating questions are who owns the IP and, um, and who are the inventors. Uh, and we have to figure that out before we even get to protecting the intellectual property, um, which is uh, a lot of times what we think of as the first step. But there are sponsors that may have rights. Um, there are uh, materials, uh, there's materials providers that may have provided materials to the research that may impact the ownership or who has what sort of rights to that technology. Um, and we want to get that stuff knocked out uh, quickly and early because nobody's going to want to invest in your technology um, if there isn't clarity uh, around not just the IP position, but also um, ownership of that IP position. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, definitely something to be aware of about where your funding comes from, where your materials are coming from. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And then another more general question here um, is, from, from Georgia Tech and Emory, what types of licenses are, are most common? Are they typically to existing uh, corporations, larger companies that are looking to in-license add to their pipeline, or is it more towards small startups and kind of uh, faculty-initiated companies? Um, at, at Tech, we probably do 85, 90% of our uh, licenses are to existing companies. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on the year, 10 to 15% are to startup companies. Um, and I, I don't think that's largely dissimilar at most major research institutions. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, uh, as, as Terry knows, I mean, for decades, um, we've been surveying uh, the academic technology transfer industry. Um, and it's long been the mantra that 80% of the deals get done with established 20 uh, companies and 20% with startups. Um, your individual experience may vary a little bit from, from that. Um, but that's, that's essentially what it is. Um, and it feels like it's changed a little bit in the last decade or so. Um, and, and the percentage has maybe grown a little bit uh, in favor of startups uh, with university strong interest um, in startups uh, over the last decade and a half, maybe the last two decades even, um, and recognitions that were part of the economic development ecosystem. And the taxpayers wanna see not only new products come to market, but new jobs be created. Um, so even with that strong, strong focus, and it wasn't that way in the early 90s, um, but even with that strong, strong focus, it still seems like the percentage um, hasn't changed um, all that much. Although, like I said, I would say that it feels like, um, just empirically, like we've seen some creep up in the number of startups, but, um, but it's still uh, the lion's share is still done with established companies. Great. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, well, I think we're about at time. I don't see any more open questions from the audience here. So I just wanted to say thank you again uh, to our panelists, Jason, Jackie, and Tariana. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, thank you as well to Todd and Terry for joining for the Tech Transfer Perspective. Um, and yeah, hopefully this was a, a useful discussion for everyone. Thank you. Bye.